Hi right, everybody. Hello. How do you feel? Hello. Thanks for coming out. DEF CON 864. New year. New DEF CON 864. Same old DEF CON 864. There will be some changes, so I'll get into just some summary. We don't have any slides or anything for the announcement stuff, uh, but just first core tenants and values. I see some new faces to the group, so definitely welcome. Uh, we started back in 2018 now, so we're still rocking and rolling. Uh, I'm Cal, one of the leads. This is Overcast, who's going to be our presenter today, also one of our leads and founders. Uh, and then if you're also a lead, you know, just kind of raise your hand. We'll do intros, you know, after the, the deal, but if you are ever interested in giving a talk or contributing to the group, like just talk to one of us that are one of the leads and we'll help get you set up to be able to, to give a presentation. Uh, other announcements, uh, call for papers are open for the Carolina Code Conference that runs in the upstate, so kind of want to give a plug there because pretty cool conference. And the call for papers for the DEF CON conference out in Vegas is also open, so worth noting. Uh, more locally to the DEF CON 864 group, we're going to do a little bit of a change of format to not so much our meeting format, but the content that we present during our meetings. So normally we've just been, the content we present is just the content that we present. It can be a blue or defense oriented talk, or it could be a career talk, or it could be an offensive security talk, or I could be up here talking, it could be about anything. Um, so we're gonna take a different approach where we're gonna do the best job we can from a lead perspective to kind of uh, do like a series, a, a blue talk, a red talk, a career talk, a blue talk, a red talk, a career talk. So that way it's a bit of a rotation. And with the career talks, if we don't have anything majorly lined up, then we're probably going to make sure we set up like social events. Because um, we're a community, we like that aspect of being able to network and meet folks. I think over the years we've been doing this, quite a few folks have broken into cybersecurity from other careers or from college or have gone through life situations like being laid off and this group being able to help them make connections that get them into their next role. So we like to emphasize, you know, we're the, if you're a member of I, ISSA, we're like the non-career focused or unprofessional ISSA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let's say we're, 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 hands are we're less business, more hands off. There we go. We still focus a lot on career. We do focus a lot on career. Um, we'll even do things like resume reviews and things like that. So just join us on our Discord if you're ever interested in anything like that. That's it for the announcement side, just kind of given that, that kind of shift in direction. We're going to post some info once it's a little bit more firmed up and, and finalized on what that's going to look like so that way there's no guessing what month is going to be oriented to which certain way. Uh, and then we'll do some more alignment just on resources wise to make it easier. I think the, the only other piece to that I want to add is what we would normally do, the normal format is, you know, starting up, someone does the announcing talk, that's me doing this right now, that then goes into the main presenter and they have their segment that goes anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. And then after that, we do is it intros. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, do, we go around the room in intros. The intro is just so you know, you can give your handle, you can give your real name, or you can opt not to give anything at all. Totally cool. And then after that, we do an open project segment. So about 15 to 20 minutes where if you're working on something cool, then you get the floor and you get to kind of share what it is you're working on. Some folks have taken the time to kind of give a lead into a talk that they're going to give at DEF CON 864. Uh, I know I normally ramble about the mud work that I do, so it's a good uh, platform for that. After that, we kind of break out into just open conversation for probably whatever amount of time is left until the library kicks us out. Uh, that was the normal time where we would set up like a red team village, a blue team village, and a career village. That's the piece or the element that's kind of going to retract because it's a little bit too much to kind of manage. And then at the end of the day, a lot of us are just really networking and conversing and, and meeting the people around us. So that's it from the update side. Overcast? Ready? I'm going to hand the floor over to you. All right. Hey, everybody. Hey. Let me get this fired up here. You know, just real quick while I'm putting this up here, uh, if ISSA is the business side, then we're the party in the back. <laughs> so welcome to the my talk 
here tonight, DEFCON 864. This is unfortunately a great deal of misery and pain on my part that I've gone through to a certain degree. Uh, the topic here tonight is called Resilience on the Witness Stand. Uh, and I want to thank you all for showing up tonight and uh, taking part or at least a little bit of an interest in some of my own personal pain over the last few years. A uh, quick little intro about myself, uh, a little bit more of the obligatory about me type slide. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ben, but I go by Overcast here in the group. I work professionally in cybersecurity, covering a pretty broad stretch of different roles uh, to help different um, one main organization reach their compliance objectives. But primarily my objective, my passion is just being a part of this group and helping it grow over the last five years. I'm personally really glad you're here tonight. Um, but tonight I want to share with you one of the most challenging uh, experiences of my life that's played out over the last seven years and quite frankly is still ongoing today. This has not concluded. So I've been called to appear on a witness stand twice during the last seven years and only one of them actually panned out, but I still had to show up, I still had to be ready to go. And it was through that time that I realized that there's a lot of parallels between what we do in cybersecurity, what we do in hacking, that do relate to being well prepared if you ever get called on the witness stand, or heaven forbid you're actually the target of a lawsuit. So <clears throat> the, the only thing I really have on this slide that I think I want to highlight for you is, you know, I was unwillingly sued in 2017. That same individual went on to then name other people in my same neighborhood uh, for five additional lawsuits. We are now up to six lawsuits and uh, I think five legal actions, be it um, arbitration sessions or something along those lines that's not necessarily baked into the core system itself. So just shy of 10 total, maybe just over 10 total legal events and activities. And even though I was mainly in this one case, uh, what you'll see is that <laughs> that is by, I'm laughing, but inside there's a great deal of pain and crying that seems to be taking place in there. But um, it, it it's far more consuming than what it just looks like on the surface. So. I've, I've got ten, top, 10 slides in total, so if you get bored, just like if you were sitting in on a court case, it'd be very boring. There are numbers at the bottom of the slide, so you can keep track of where we are in this, in, in this boring process. We're already 20% through. Exactly. That is, that is what we're looking for, people, positivity. <laughs> but I've also scattered through with a, a bunch of pretty pictures for you to enjoy. But first, let me ask you a question, and I know that some people immediately raise their hand whenever somebody says, quick show of hands. So I'm going to pause for a second. So a quick show. Sorry. So a quick show of hands. Who wants to get sued? Nobody. And I'm not going to name names if anybody did raise their hand. So that whether we're recording or if you're online, there's nobody's name that's going to be given to see this because nobody really goes through life wandering dark alleys, thinking to themselves, "Hey, you know, maybe I'll get sued today. Maybe I'll have that rare opportunity of working with attorneys." and going through that whole attorney-client privilege in my personal life outside of my work life. Because it's one thing in your work life when the attorney sends you something and says, I need an investigation into this matter. By the way, everything in this mail chain needs to be tagged as attorney-client privilege, right? That's one thing. But when your own personal email, when your own personal correspondence comes into play, you feel rather exposed because that corporate presence doesn't seem to be present. You know, we're just in this case, you're just wandering down life's alley looking for things, and somebody may have their own interest to come after you and sue you. And I know that seems far-fetched, but let me rephrase the question. And tonight we're going to go over to Double Dogs for the after party, but if somebody were to walk into that restaurant itching for a fight, like a barroom hero who is just looking for fisticuffs, you know, we can't stop or change that person. We can do everything we can to de-escalate it. We can try and calm down the situation. We can do our best to move out of the environment. We, we are faced with tough choices when some, someone enters a scenario like that. Um, but it, it, the ultimate responsibility, at, like if we can decide I'm not throwing a punch. Like I'm not going to jail tonight. Like that's one of my first rules when I wake up in the morning. I'm not going to jail today willingly. So in this scenario here, you know, this individual is asking who wants to get punched in the throat? which is very similar, in my opinion, to the question of who wants to get sued. This individual is looking for a fight. They're, they're out to do something. They want to get into, uh, and quite frankly, the person over their right shoulder kind of looks like Zoidberg, so, so maybe Zoidberg, I don't know. Um, you know, we don't always get a choice for who's going to, to show up in a scenario like this. 
And this is why I was pretty surprised when I was watching uh, This Week Tonight with John Oliver when he actually covered slap suits. And those are lawsuits where someone with a lot of time on their hand and a whole lot of money uses the legal system to inflict pressure, lots of lawsuits, the threats of lots of lawsuits, in order to coerce or control a situation. They try and shut down any critics to whether it's the company or themselves. Uh, they try and deflect. They try and control other people through the threat of those lawsuits or the control of those lawsuits to take action that that person wants. We have language for that in cybersecurity. That's a threat actor, right? And they're exploiting the court system and their funds to take action against somebody else, a victim in this case. So first of all, love John and Oliver. Like every, everything, like in fact, I wish I had an accent because it would probably make this talk a whole lot more interesting is tracking numbers and pretty pictures on the screen, right? But um, if, if you were ever found yourself having a knock on your door and opening up and being served a subpoena, if you were ever summoned into a court or if you were ever actually just included on a suit, uh, it, it would have a huge effect on your life. It, ha it has on mine. It, it changed all the trajectory and plans that I had starting in 2017, and that hasn't changed or stopped. So I can set goals in my life right now, but I know full, full well that if I get a call that says, we're on the docket again for the court case, this is the time we're going to need to show up, my schedule needs to change. My goals and priorities need to change. Um, it, it affects your family life. It affects your work life. And like I said, especially with these slap suits, uh, in, the, in my case, and I'll get into more details about it a little bit later on, when someone has way more money than, and time to them, especially if they assume that them being heard in a courtroom is important and cool in their eyes, they're basically paying to get what they want. Time in front of a jury, time in front of a judge, that to them is the best part of their day. For the rest of us, this is misery, full halt on everything else you had going on in your life. So there's a couple layers of the court system that I want to highlight here, and this is actually a real photograph of what it looks like in the United States today, going from the lower courts and progressing up to the highest court, which is the U.S. Supreme Court. You can think of these as being like a pyramid, with the majority of all cases related to law being at that lower tier. Like anybody and everybody can file some kind of a court request at, a, at that lower tier. That's magistrate court. Um, master of equity, there's a ton of different types of courts at that lower tier. Uh, family court, civil court, um, circuit courts in general are, uh, for each county. There's a bunch of, of circuit courts to help meet those needs. But those judges at that level, those courts have to entertain all of that information that's flowing into them. Okay, the, the courts above that, they have much more discretion. The challenge here is your court if, if this is where you enter in, those courts' plan is to drag this session out because they want to give both parties lots of time to reach something called a settlement. We've all heard this, right? It, this is as unsexy of a process. I can't believe Hollywood can make a TV show or movies that makes this look exciting. This is a very monotonous, boring, dry scenario. For those of us who have spent a lot of time looking at logs, eating code, reviewing like investigations where you have to get it right of did something happen or did it not happen, that's what this is all about. It's all about documentation and evidence. Now if in my case, for example, the we prevailed in the lower court, the other party didn't like that. And what's better than standing up in front of a judge at a lower court, standing in front of three judges at the appellate court. So within a few days, they filed the appeal. So now we're starting the whole process over again. We're moving up into the appeals court. Thankfully, the appeals court doesn't have to accept everything that somebody raises their hand. But at the same time, death row inmates, you know, somebody who didn't like the way their grass was cut, a contract violation between organizations, all that's in the same pot heading toward the appellate court. I don't know about you, but if I was serving a long jail sentence, I would hope that my court case would get a better hearing quicker in that flow than somebody who just didn't, you know, what seems like a very frivolous lawsuit, which quite frankly was the one I was involved in. Um, so after that appeals court process, the individual can then appeal it to the state Supreme Court, and that's the highest one in the state. And thankfully, these people um, respond really quickly. It's the same type of appellate court, but they move much quicker. In my case, it was like a few days, maybe a week or two by the time that was resolved. But I'll show you the numbers, and I wish it was always like that. 
Um, at the same time, COVID did kick in here at some point in the process, so I'll show you how that played into, into the scope. But, um, and then the U.S. Supreme Court receives roughly about 7,000 requests annually from every protectorate and state uh, across the United States, but they only accept on average roughly around 75 to hear. So, I mean, that's a, a massive focused pool there, to put that into perspective. But it was through this whole process, it started with me in about 2018, I started to see some of the parallels between what I was going through with some of the attorneys, um, some of the information that we were having to get together, and it finally dawned on me that, you know, a lot of the work that I've done in my career kind of plays into this. I was being asked to provide evidence related to email change, um, timelines of events, and I was like, you know, this is very similar to what we do with incident response. We have to formulate what happened when. Um, and so I, in, at one point I just dumped email into different type of analysis tools to start making that timeline a lot easier to flow because we're talking about um, 20 messages in five months and then all the amplification of the replies to those messages and then sorting what the content looked like for each of those. You know, content parsing and analysis. I mean, that seemed fairly easy, building a timeline. Uh, but for me, the, the biggest fear factor was I can do all this, I can get this all related, I can start to correlate it. In my, at my time of doing this, I was also still on the board of directors, and this was all related to an HOA. And I know some of you might say, HOAs, that's all that this happens. But the interesting thing about that slide that I mentioned about slap suits, any single person in the United States with money and time on their hand can take any other person in the United States into a court of law again and again and again and you have to go through a huge amount of hoops to prove that individual has almost what we would consider and call malicious intent you know so for us that boiled down to five times five times um, so from a career perspective uh, I've been working in cybersecurity uh, for a long time. I've been working in IT since I was doing some consulting work in my late teens and then um, working professionally maybe 19, early 20s, a really long time. Uh, but the last decade, maybe 15 years, has really been focused more on the GRC side and then making sure that every team that's associated with IT and cybersecurity is properly aligned either with legal or regulatory controls. So it, after a while, it started to become almost second nature to have a conversation with the attorneys about, okay, what exactly do you need? Like, be really clear, because remember, if you're on a call with a lawyer, the clock is ticking. Like, I care about you as a human, but I'm not really not interested how your holiday and New Year's was. Like time is literal money with an attorney on the call, and you will be billed even if you spend an hour talking about their family and having a great time down in the Cayman Islands over the holidays. That's on your bill that you'll have to negotiate after the fact. So you want to be on point, on target. A couple things that jumped out at me in regards to how audits con connect and align with the legal system uh, were that. I looked at attorneys, especially if they were on the opposing side, because I was a defendant. The prosecuting attorneys kind of struck me as auditors. You don't get to pick your auditors. You don't get to pick who walks through your door to audit your company, especially in my line of work. I don't get to pick who. In that regard, it made it easier for me to perceive the other person as just an auditor as opposed to this human that feels like they're just nonstop harassing and coming after me personally. It helped me put a level of personality in there that my, my personal being just could, like, could not stand. Um, but I've also experienced some, the process, I'm calling them auditees on here, and that's just people who are being audited. It's a made up word, I guess. I don't know, I didn't look it up. Um, but those are people who are being audited. And one of, in my experience of auditing, especially in my previous role, we were going into random organizations all the time. We're going to random DOD installations and sitting down with people who had varying degrees of experience being asked very detailed technical questions about their infrastructure. Like, have you applied this security control to that asset? And a lot of them would get very defensive. Like, you've heard the, the phrase of like, you know, how dare you say my baby's ugly? Well, that's not what we're saying, right? Because we tend to get our identity very closely associated with the systems that we manage. I know when I was a DBA or a systems admin, and that was, those were my systems. Like, I had a huge responsibility for them. They stayed up. They kept processing. We were able to recover and restore them. But when it came to um, other folks at times, even myself, I noticed that when I would have an auditor or a team of auditors come in, I would start getting almost hyperventilating, like, how dare you ask those questions? Like, don't you know that we're doing the best we can with this? Like, here's all the things we tried to get done. Look at all these change requests, you know? Um, and I wanted to defend myself. 
the reality is when you're on the hot seat, this isn't story time. This is time for facts. You may not be providing forensics evidence in an audit, but you want to be sticking as close to yes or no answers and providing here's what it shows in the document that I'm required to do, here's the setting that's set in the system, and here's how we audit it on the other side. Logs are going in here. They're immune. Like basically that level of conversation, right? Simple sentence type stuff, not, not story time. And that became the same, exact same thing I was hearing from the attorneys. When you're on the stand, when you're being cross-examined by the prosecuting attorney, it's yes or no answers. Don't tell stories. Because the longer you go on your stories, you might start to forget some facts or you might get tripped up in your words and now you're giving them extra things that they can hook into and pull apart. So I began to look at the other prosecuting attorneys much more clearly as just an auditor. Yes or no responses. In fact, when I got on the stand, the first thing this guy said was, Your Honor, I want you to require this individual to give yes or no responses. And in my mind, I was just dying laughing because I was thinking, you are requiring me to do the exact opposite of what you should be asking me not to do. You should want story time. You should want me to try and give enough rope to trip myself up. So at the, at the end of the day, uh, especially now where it came up in the last couple months, be kind, be respectful, and be a good human. Uh, specifically, um, the court expects a certain degree of professionalism when you walk in. You could wear t-shirts and jeans if you wanted to. If you're in a jury trial, think about how that's casting you in light of what you're being asked. Is it, is it presenting you in a professional way? I don't think I look great in anything that I wear. So I put on a suit. Maybe that'll help, I don't know. Um, and I sat in that box for quite a few hours. Um, the worst part was we had to take a lunch break and the judge, um, I forget what he called it. They, there's all kinds of legal words. Like I'm okay with technical words. I'm okay with compliance words. But when the judge was using words, I was like, I think I know what you mean. He was like, do not speak about this case to anyone during the break. And I was like, OK, well, let's make it a 30-minute break. Because I've been on the stand. I'd really love to talk to some of my friends about what's been going on up here. And he was like, we're going to take a two-hour recess. And in my mind, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. And then our, our attorney was like, well, let's all go out and grab a bite to eat. So myself and all the other people that were going to get up on the witness stand and us went out to lunch. And let me tell you, that was the longest lunch I've ever been on. But the same is true during an audit. If you've ever been in-house for an audit, as an introvert, that first day is the longest day of my life. Hey, we brought in food. We can have a working lunch. We're not going to work. We'll just talk and catch up. Well, now we're doing story time in front of our, all of our auditors that are here. Right? How is this going to play out? You know? And so by the time th Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday start to come on an audit, you've already checked as many boxes as you're going to check. You know where your gaps are should have already kind of know that before you're going into an audit, quite frankly. No surprises. Um, <clears throat> but no matter how much you feel depleted on the energy scale, you want to maintain a respectful attitude. I did not respect this individual that was questioning me at all. I didn't respect the client at all, just based on what I'd been through for the last seven years. But I still said, yes, sir, no, sir. I'm respecting the position of the, that's asking me those questions. If that's the way you need to couch it to get through in a respectful manner in front of the court, do it. Uh, one other witness um, uh, that I saw did, did, did not conduct themselves very respectfully to the judge or the court and questioned the court's ability to, um, or what they had said, and, and that got shut down very quickly. So, and that's in front of a jury, right? So you don't want to ever come across as being confrontational to opposing counsel, hopefully not even your counsel especially, um, but most importantly not the court, which is the judge, uh, or, the, or the people in the jury box. But aside from audit, there's a ton of other roles uh, that, I've, that I've portrayed or been in that I've, I've helped, seen that help portray and, and prepare me for being on that stand. And I mentioned earlier uh, about doing SOC analysis or incident response. And I honestly always thought that doing an investigation around a compromise or some kind of forensics analysis would be what landed me on a witness stand. Because you, you, know, you always hear in your courses when you're coming through college and grad school and other stuff, you know, here's how you do analysis. Keep your notes really clear. Keep your evidence, you, you know, 
detailed and annotated because when you're on the stand, that's what they're going to try and pick apart. And the reality is in, in, in your personal life, it's pretty much the same kind of thing. As soon as that subpoena hit my hand, I immediately knew I didn't want discovery. I don't want this individual having the freedom to dig through my life. Well, did you do any of this stuff that I'm bringing you in on a lawsuit? Did you do any of that on your work asset? Did you do any of it through your work phone? Did you do any of it in your work email? Okay, my attorneys need to do discovery on that asset. Like you, you don't, in my opinion, you, know, you don't have, that's, that's not my asset, that's, that's the company's asset. You don't get to supersede the legal requirements of that. So that to me was a huge stress factor. I did not want that to come into play. Uh, so I've tried as best I can to separate my personal and my work life. So even if my work, my personal life got completely trashed through discovery, completely dragged out, um, I did not want anything with my employer, which honestly, probably six months before this happened, no, it was 10 months, 10 months pretty much to the day before this happened, I'd started a new job. So here's this fresh person in this role, now suddenly coming in going, hey, my, all my devices are being seized for discovery. Are, are you, you legal folks okay with that? Are we good? You know, communications, do I need to, like that's not the conversations you want to be having with your legal departments or your bosses, uh, quite frankly. But I did inform, um, my direct managers, I let them know what was going on, and I let them know, I don't know what the timelines are gonna look like for this. I may have to take sporadic calls throughout the day to talk with lawyers. And there were so many calls. One of the tactics that was used by the opposing counsel was, and I didn't know this for a really long time, remember I mentioned that if you talk to your attorney, clock is ticking. You're getting billed time, right? Because they're working on your case. Well, behind the scenes, because we're, we're wanting to move towards settlement, not the actual trial day. If opposing counsel is calling your attorney four and five times a day, you're getting billed for it. Now, it's a mixed bag, right? It's a double-edged sword because you have to show the court and opposing counsel that you're willing to work and compromise towards a, hopefully a great remediation. But what we found was this person would take five steps forward and 10 steps back every single day. Whatever progress had been made in negotiations in the morning was all retracted by the end of the day. So you started all back over again the next day. It was incredibly frustrating. Our, the bills for this were um, tens of thousands of dollars. And then now you're in the category of negotiation. How well do you negotiate with your attorney to figure out what counts as a bill? How can it get settled down? Like what can, payment plans, like how does that all go? Is it a lump sum? Like no, none of us want to be in that scenario of trying to negotiate that scenario. It's one thing when you have to negotiate a contract for work. That's different, right? It's part of growing and maturing in your organization. So the, the big thing for me that I took out of this too was, and the last technical rule I want to touch on was, even if you're doing like web app development, pen testing, bug bounty hunting, we're all used to gathering around an application and collaborating together. Like red teams collaborating with blue teams, we call that purple. If you do a web app assessment, you're working with the developers, you're working with the IT folks that are putting it on their infrastructure and running it, there's that collaboration. And so to look at that from a standpoint of, this attorney's on my side, and we have to just work through this and get through this. So evidence and timelines, yeah, we've got that. If you've been in any IR role, that's something that you should just be like, okay, it's gonna click, that's what I need to do. Um, exercise, I put on here, is, it, it is important. Uh, breathing techniques were really helpful for me. There's an individual called Wim Hof, who's done some breathing techniques on some crazy stuff, like how to dive into like sub-zero water and stay there for a long period of time. I didn't do that for this, but I did find myself uh, during the first, we had like a fake, the first trial thing fell out and then we wound up sitting up there to go on the stand and then it got called right before I was called on it. But some of us, when you've gone to public speak before, you, you get that sense of like cold hands, clammy hands, that sense of fear and dread of standing up in front of people and talking and you get that flutter in your chest and heart and your breathing tends to almost hyperventilate and just getting the words out are sometimes difficult and tough. Daniel Meisler uh, took the Wim Hof method before he um, and he modified it for public speaking. So what he does is like 30 rapid breaths really fast. And after you get, it seems crazy. So do this on your own privately <laughs> before you go on stage. But it really helped me before I got on the witness stand because it completely removed all those jitters. All, all that anxiety that was gonna be there, I fake forced a, a, um, a panic attack basically and then dealt with it so that when I went into the courtroom, breathing was already normal, you know. Um, 
the, the fight or flight response was already dealt with. You could just walk up and sit on the stand. So Meisler's approach is you do three rounds of this. You do 30 fast breaths and then three really slow, deep breaths. 30 fast breaths, three slow, and repeat that again. How did this play out for me? I was able to get my breathing under control, went up and sat down on the witness stand, and I just thought, okay, I'm in the auditor box. I'm just sitting here and waiting for the auditor to ask me a question. I've been through all of our systems. I know, I'm an auditor myself. I know all the questions you could ask. I'm okay with crazy stuff off the wall. Go for it. And so uh, that was in 2017, so that's at the lower court level. That took seven months to reach that point when we landed in the courtroom. And that's after a couple fake false flag attempts to go into a court. Uh, he appealed, so then we spent three years in the appeals court, two years into that process, COVID-19 hit, and then everything went crazy, right? Everybody went remote. We all, we, all of us in our businesses and schools had to figure out how we're going to do remote work for everybody, and that was including the court system. This is one of my favorite memes that came out of that whole time period because you had uh, a, a lawyer who joined a Zoom call with a judge, but he, his kid had been playing around on Zoom for their class or whatever and enabled a cat filter. And for the life of him, that attorney could not disable the cat filter. And so he's sitting there on the call saying, Your Honor, I swear I'm not a cat. I wish it was that funny in my scenario. Uh, the appeals court, you can't do anything once it goes to appeal. The entire case from the lower court is passed up with no changes. No new evidence can be introduced, nothing. So you're but you now have to engage your attorney again. So whatever bill you thought you were just about to start to settle there at the path, at the bottom, you've now started a new ticket, starting to go. Um, and that took three years um, for that response to get closed out. And then after, after that was over, then it, he kicked it up to the state Supreme Court and it spent less than a month in the state Supreme Court and then it came out. And so we, pre we prevailed at all three levels. And once it was done, we honestly all just sat back and were like, He's, he's going to try and take I'm to the state Supreme Court. And what's funny is at every single level, the attorneys were telling us, it's very rare for a case like this to ever be appealed. And I'm like, you do not know this individual. Sure enough, appellate court. Okay, it's very incredibly rare and unlikely that it's ever going to go to the state Supreme Court. Went to the state Supreme Court. So uh, again, you know, I was asked in 2017 and it didn't materialize because thankfully he had, he, it, it was so bad at the lower court level. Uh, that it was actually ruled in our favor early, and so I didn't have to testify then. But in 2023, it's like no matter what question he was presenting, again, I called back on my auditor experience and just doing assessments. And even when a, a, like an IT leader asks you a question, it's always in your best interest. Be slow. Take a breath. Think about what's being asked. And then give a clear answer. And when it was his attorney, um, I was slow mundane, methodical, but if your attorney asks you a question, you already know the case they're trying to build. You know the route they're trying to go. It's kind of like they've laid out the golden road to Oz, and you have the opportunity to make sure that your testimony don't falsify evidence, but the evidence that you're bringing forward and what you're testifying to are helping make that case. Remember, they're on your side, you're on their side. We're working together to that same common goal. And so it was just kind of real much Free, more freeing for, for your attorney to ask you questions and be able to give a more expounding answer about what had taken place. Now granted, then you got to go through cross-examination. So everything that you did over there is now fair game for the opposing counsel. It is not at all like any movie you've ever seen. There isn't an attorney on the planet who's Tom Cruise. I don't care what they look like, what they dress like. And granted, I have a very small experience pool, so just <laughs> bear, bear that in mind, right? They, uh, there are some fantastic attorneys. We, we've been represented by some amazing attorneys um, and just had a really good experience with them, Bill included, Bill aside, all that's been dealt with and taken care of, thankfully. Um, but it, it's just been a crazy experience. But the most important thing that came out of it for me from this process, I realized that the emotional intelligence growth that I've undergone through this last seven years has probably been the best that I could have undertaken. I don't know that I would have grown personally in the way that I did through this process. Um, just some summary thoughts here on it. None of us knows if we're going to get pulled into a courtroom. You know, if somebody just gets something in their head that they don't like about us, whether you're in a corporation and you're, or you're in a nonprofit or you're just a regular citizen, all of us are subject to the same thing because we all have the same freedom for our voice to be heard in a court of law. 
Um, but I, w I do want to point out that the responsibilities that you perform today could have big impacts to benefit you in the future, long term. Small wins in what you're doing in your life, you may not know how those really relate or apply. They're just like, I'm just checking logs, I'm just reviewing these alert tickets. But at the end of the day, they may roll up into big wins long term about how you organize information, how you parse large chunks of the information and correlate it down to just the, the bare essential facts. And if you are on the stand, more than likely, I did, you're going to forget some key things. Like your mind, it's like public speaking. You know, you could get up there and your mind just go blank. And that was my biggest fear. So like memorizing dates and times and number of email, like, like all the detailed evidence of that is pretty minute. So be diligent in your career tasks today, no matter how seemingly small they are. You just really don't know how it's going to play out in the long term. And if you do find yourself subpoenaed or named in a lawsuit, take a minute to take a deep breath and just realize that the world is not ending. Your, your life isn't over. You are still breathing. You are still here. Um, and accept that it's going to be a long process. Be okay with that. Be okay living in that uncomfortable pause. Um, and it, honestly, it's worth finding a really good attorney. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. And um, involves. And just like the first slide showed in all that small print, I'm not turning. This is not legal advice. If you don't agree with this presentation, just stop. So, any questions? Then in InfoSec, we have ways to privacy, like cyber ranges, boxes to hack, and, and home labs. Did you set up a, a home court? Yes and no. Not to the degree that I would love to do based on what you just said. <laughs> But I did try and have my, like my wife ask me core questions, trying to go over things. And I, was, I think there were four of us, that were, five of us that were named in that initial suit. And we did get together quite a bit. And the attorneys do run through dry runs for you. So you, I think by the time that first one came up, we probably had four tabletop exercises. And then easily before I testified here at the end of quarter four, we, we had kind of three tabletop question exercises where the attorney walked through, here's what I'm going to ask you. Like, where does that make your mind go? Make, make, let's make sure that we're aligned here. I would love to figure out a way how to make it into yeah, the gamified. Uh, you mentioned behavior is odd that because you it feels like you know the personality that you would want. Uh, like once you do something and you make a mistake, you can't get over it, and you keep doing the same thing over and over. And you go through your even at a small thing like uh, let's say take whatever. Uh, let's say you flirt with someone. And they're so scared at that point to make sure you can do whatever you want to some people. Other people, they don't even like sharing a cafeteria. And so it just depends. Like at that point, you don't even want to try. And so I'm just trying to understand the behavior of why this is going on over and over again. I would love to know. I would love you to know. You know better than I do. I, I, I've, in trying to, like we talked about on the slide about the, with the guy with the fisticuffs, I, was, I mentioned de escalation. We, Numerous people, not just the board that I was on, but numerous boards and numerous people in this group have sat down one-on-one -on -one with that individual, and there was a persistent, like, if it wasn't his understanding, it wasn't going to go. So you sat one-on-one -on -one with him without any recording or anything? Yeah. Because you can't record. Like, the, the times that you do record, you, you pretty much need to let people know that you're recording, right? Can he tell you honestly what's wrong or not? I mean, how many of us are going to be fully transparent yeah. in our worst Moments when of no life. There for you, you don't know what to do, right? Yeah. I, I'm not a so psychologist. I have no one idea. Person, make sure it's one person and say, see, nothing's wrong with me, and then they're seeking out for help from someone else. So they're, I think everyone has a good heart. They just understand what's going on with them. But I don't know who had their hand up first. So, a couple things on this. Number one, Always remember in life there are some people who are not happy unless they're making someone else miserable. Um, you know, that, that is just some people. I, you know, in the many years of dealing with all kinds of different people in all kinds of different situations, there are, there are people who are not happy. They're, they're not content in life unless they have made somebody miserable or are making somebody miserable. Why would um, they do that? And there's nothing you can do to change it. And yeah, if I mean, that's your boss, leave. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can go out of your way to try to bend over backwards and satisfy them, and you won't. 
and it's not going to happen. You might think you get a win. You're going to find out that that win is going to be turned into a knife yep. the following day yep. to be used against you. And, and you can't change that. But on the other side of that, one of the biggest things that we have to learn, especially I think in cybersecurity, especially when you're dealing with someone else, we need to try to make sure that we, as much as absolutely possible, try not to make our interaction with them feel to them like it's on a personal level. You know, when I have yep. somebody who improperly responds to an email, I need to work really hard to make sure that they aren't looking at it as, I'm holding this improper response to this email against you, and this is going to be the thing I'm going to beat you over the head with for the next 15 years. I need to get them to understand, hey, Okay, you misresponded. That's great. How are we going to work to go forward and, and fix the problem? And this is an area where there's a, a lot of a lot of people have a difficulty separating the personal feelings that come up at those moments of time from a we'll call it business interaction of this is an issue, this is something we gotta fix, we're trying to come up with a resolution. And some people are good at it. Some people are crappy at it. You see, I like his approach. Every every phone and computer is companies. Mine is always personal phone, so you can mix work on personal. Mine's just a personal phone. It's easier to separate that. I look dumb a lot of times carrying around two phones, and I, the one I've got's rotating out. But three or four at one point in yep. time, just because. Yeah. But through, through this experience that, and, and Russell talked about it at one talk he had maybe a year or two ago around segmenting your life based on your, your threat modeling. And there's one key mistake that I made and that was my personal Gmail account was used to conduct some of the business. And so that's where I was like, all right, fine. I just burned that identity, ready to go. I, I, I can stand up another Gmail account and go forward. And, you know, because from my perspective, as soon as an attorney looks at it, I will never use that again. <laughs> That's gone. Yeah. Hang on, sorry. Yeah, yeah, going for it. Yeah, uh, you have a question? A more of a process question, yeah. not like a personal finances question. But like you mentioned at one point, like you, know, you got to sell up the bill at the end of the day and everything. Um, and you know, you go through all of this, and like it's shown, like you didn't do any wrongdoing. You're on the defense the whole time. Is there like a recourse for putting some of that cost? That is a the other great question. Thing? Or is this like? This is the cost of misfortune. Like you broke a leg, you get a hospital bill. Like you got targeted unjustly, you still got to pay the attorney. Yes, and so TV and movies will let you will kind of portray the picture of well, you prevailed, so the other person pays your legal bills. Mm -hmm. We prevailed, and I think the max we could could charge back for our legal fees was about twenty eight hundred dollars in the first tier. <laughs> At the appellate court tier, I don't think any of that came back on it so through all, so basically we're taking you're, you're taking tens and tens of thousands of dollars hits for each of those tiers and you're getting back like twenty hundred dollars and keep in mind if they don't pay now you now you've got to file a motion with the court because now they're in contempt of a court order and so now it's a whole different process and guess what you need in order to continue that go forward you need more money for the lawyer to continue that going forward but in that process at those different tiers you're starting those payments way before some of these other pieces so we were paying on the first tier court at the lower court level before the appellate court was done and that took three years so then the appellate court bill gets finalized and wrapped up and that gets served to you now you got to figure that out going out Hey, uh, so on the facts versus story, story time that you're talking about, uh, I don't even know if I'm asking this in relative to the courts or cybersecurity, but I, I occasionally, I guess, uh, as a developer, you ask questions of, you know, are we checking this box or that box? And always my, I always feel like the questions are vague. Like, okay. I, I don't know if it's my pedantic nope. sort of nature, but I'm always like, well, if you interpret that way, then yes. If you interpret that way, then no. And so I guess the question is, am I you know, engaging in story time with that? And should I just say, well, I'm going to interpret it the way it works best for me, and so I'm going to say yes. Or should yes. I say, I'm going to interpret it the worst way possible and say no. Or, or should I engage in story time? It is smart to critically think about that. Because what you'll hear about from our legislators up in the congr congressional level is they're putting forward bills because they're asking their technology advisors 
can we really break email encryption? Like, can we technically feasibly have a backdoor to read email? Like, could that be possible? And if you're a technologist, you typically go, well, yeah, it's possible, yeah. right? I mean, anything's possible, yeah, right. right? Lawyers and con congressmen hear that and they go, fantastic, we need to bill for that. So that's that tier, that level. That was a huge discussion down at DEF CON in Vegas this past year in the policy village. But to your point, I would think very carefully about how that might be twisted in. Because from an auditor perspective, they want to ask wide ranging, just very open, fuzzy questions. Yeah. And they want you to play around with trying to find where it is. You can give them, honestly, from an auditor perspective, you can give them any answer you want. You just need to defend it, provide evidence for it, your requirements document or whatever it may be. Yeah, so I guess they should, if an auditor is asking me, or, you know, someone has gotten some sort of query tech thing asking me, I don't know if it's an official auditor, but, you know, they're saying, are you doing this? You know, should I say just yes? And, and then if they ever ask, I can say, well, in this, under this interpretation? Or should I say, well, because, if you think of it this way, this way, you know, and I get into story time. I would not get into story time. I would not get into story time. You answer the question that's given. If they ask you, do you know what time it is, you look at your watch and say yes. But the yep. thing is, is the 100%. questions are so vague, it could be yes or not. The onus is on them to clarify it. So it'll be like, I don't understand the question. Can you rephrase that? Like, and that, that a lot of times is the case here. Like, it, it goes back to almost, can you use that in a sentence yeah, level? Yeah, like, definition. you need to get really precise. Or yeah. if there's a way that you could defend answering the way you want to, answer the way you want to. Okay. Okay. Now, if they then say, defend that, and they don't like your defense, that's, yeah. I mean, it, at least for audits, and I mean, I've done a lot of these, especially through the military, through, oh, yeah. through you know, uh, uh, federal government, DOD, right? An auditor comes in and asks you a yes or no question, you answer yes or no. Because the thing is, I, I want to be honest, and the, the That's right it. answer isn't, it, it's not yes or no. Like, it, right. there, there is nuance to it. And, and but in the context of legal yeah. or compliance, it, there, there's no black, it's there, black and white. It's black and white. Yes. I live the same problem, you know. I don't know if it's a developer thing or not, but, you know, I know the world of potential. It's yeah. yep. capable. So it's like, should I give you the answer that I think that, I should give you, which is usually the developer one that takes you down <laughs> the world of possibility, or should I just give you the answer to that? It's the auditor answer. The, the, the right answer auditor. you want to hear and when I can defend if I interpret however I want to interpret it. Okay. But you're assuming context in that scenario. You're filling in the gap that they haven't provided. And anybody with a hacker mind is already thinking of those possibilities. Oh, yeah. You're living in that fog that. very comfortably. And they're asking a question typically from a narrow lens to begin with. They might not even understand the question they're asking. Yeah. yeah. They, yeah. Might, yeah. They, they, they may ask a question, yes. They really don't understand what it is. It's on their sheet of, hey, these are questions I have to ask. So even if you go into story time, they're still lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You just send them a picture. You just create, it, create some AI art and send it to them. That's all you got to do. Well, in some ways, that's a good picture. I love this picture so much. All right, that's all I got. Thank you all.